Games and Nonsense. I am your friendly host, Zach, uh, and I'm joined by other people. Uh, Abby Gumdrops. Hi. Uh, Dakota Fanning. This is the second time in a row we've made that joke. It's not going to be funny. And uh, Devon Lightly. <laughs> I like it. I, I, I can roll with it, yeah. Alright. <laughs> so, uh, today's subject, because I feel like talking about stuff like the uh, cartoons, stuff we liked as our childhood, and maybe cartoons we like today. Um, and so, we have a, a new person on the show today at, with one Miss Devin something or other. Uh, so, why don't you go ahead and tell us about one of your favorite cartoons growing up? Probably my absolute favorite cartoon growing up was Curse the Cowardly Dog. Good choice, good choice. Like, absolutely. Yes. Mm-hmm. Just love the horror. I still remember uh, my... Ag- a- a- agreeing applause. Mm-hmm. Play agreeing applause. Uh, my dad and I still have this joke where we make uh, the one character, Fred, who always talked in oh, rhyme, yes. would go, naughty. So now whenever I do something that he doesn't quite approve of, he goes, naughty to me. And it just... It, it's just something that stuck with me for a long time. Return the slap or, or suffer, suffer my curse. curse. It, it, An episode used to scare the crap out of me now as a younger. What's your payment? <laughs> What's your <laughs> offer? Yes. But it was, but like looking back on it, the CG the used for was so silly and bad. But when you're a kid, you don't know that you're like, oh god, scary. Yeah, but and also the fact Courage the Cow that was part of the age where TV animation was starting to generally improve. Right. And Dying just because of the weird style of the show, like they could get away with a lot of the more questionable yeah, animation like, moments. That was one thing about the show is they use a lot of really different, like odd animation things here and there, so seeing them jump into a weird um <clears throat> art style of sorts was never like out of the question. But it also made Courage the Cowardly Dog, you know, stick out to what it is. Mm-hmm. It, I think it's also, as far as I know, besides Goosebumps, it was one of the only horror-esque there was, shows. There was Are You Afraid of the Dark, which was, yeah. which was the Nickelodeon rip-off of Goosebumps. Yeah, but those, yeah. those kinds of shows. But the, those only really showed around Halloween. Courage the Cowardly Dog was all the time. It was the only, like, horror genre-esque thing that was targeted towards Yeah, children. but it, 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 at most times, it kind of came across more as parody of horror than outright it horror like, of itself. Like, I mean, it. Th- there were times where it could legitimately be kind of scary. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was a kid's show, so, you know, there, there's a line to cross. Right. But, you know, I, like, looking back on it, it's probably, it's a, it's a lot more like, huh. Oh, because that's a that, that's a horror trope that mm-hmm. they're making fun of right there is the, the thing. Well, that's what they well that's what they did. There was an episode that was a parody of The Exorcist, mm-hmm. where Mira got possessed by that mattress. You know, kick them in the dishpan. Who who who? Yeah, but, and you know, for for somebody who's called Courage the Cowardly Dog, he wasn't exactly all that cowardly. I think that was also like, the point that his name was Courage, and that was a very like. Yeah, profound but like, they, theme throughout the show. They they make it. They always set it up to be, you know, like an ironic name. But it was like, no, it's not really all that ironic. Hmm. I mean, it's, he doesn't take any particular enjoyment out of everything that's happening around him. But like, he shuts up and deals. I think that's one of the messages in Courage, though. Mm-hmm. Like, even though it's a parody and it's funny and it's kind of scary, it's not like, yeah, these things scare you. But you still gotta do them, so you right. should do them with even if you're scared, and it's okay to be scared. Mm-hmm. So that's what courage is. Super <laughs> spoopy. All right, so uh, Miss Fanning, what have you got? Should, do I? Do you want me to answer you in this podcast? <laughs> I mean, you could just stay silent the entire time. I don't think anybody's gonna notice. Ouch! <laughs> wow, that's rude. Any, anyway, I bet you we're gonna get one of our one of our viewers. I'm gonna be their favorite for some reason, <laughs> and they're gonna get mad at you for this comment. So Dakota, I'll get my Dakota, 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 Dakota. I know, I know, cartoons. <laughs> and if we have to mention cartoons, specifically cartoons for the '90s, we have to mention the cartoon that pretty much ended the '90s on pretty much on such a high point. It would have to be SpongeBob SquarePants. I can't think of a single cartoon. That has really become as much of a cultural phenomenon for my generation 
as SpongeBob. That's true. True. SpongeBob has kind of reached that sort of echelon that also occupies the likes of like Bugs Bunny and the other Looney Tunes, Mickey Mouse and the other Disney clan. Like it did not take long for SpongeBob to get there. I mean, he kind of like as far as like ratings go, he kind of had a rocky start with the first two seasons. But by the third one, at least, that's when the series really kind of hit its stride. Mm-hmm. Then Steven Hillenburg left, and then, well, that's yeah. that's that's a matter of debate yeah. of taste yeah. beyond that. After that, it just became less good. Right after the movie ended, that's the real tipping point. But mm-hmm. as a kid, I can still remember the first three seasons of Spongebob being some of the most memorable humor and character interaction that I've seen Definitely. on TV, well, well period amongst the three networks. A, a large reason for that, because of that, at least for those early seasons of Spongebob, um, it wasn't just kind of like, you know, very kid humor. It was just humor. Like, it was it, it, it built, it was based on a lot of, like, old classic slapstick and pun making and all sorts of other things that, you know, that it, it, it kind of transcended the whole kid show uh, stigma. I mean, granted, it did have a lot of its sillier moments. It was still a kid's cartoon. But it wasn't so much just like, yeah, we know we're a kid's cartoon, so this is the stuff you come to expect. But it was just more like, this is just stuff that we find funny. Yeah, it's pure, simple comedy animation with the, with the at least for the time, a unique premise and very memorable writing and characters. Like, to this day, I like if you go to, like, pretty much any college in the U.S. right now, I know this is at least true for me. You can make, like, a random SpongeBob reference in the conversation. And it will snowball. Just, yeah, that could just steamroll into a whole conversation about SpongeBob that's pretty much just humor based off of SpongeBob references, particularly from the first three seasons. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's magic. I thought it happened to me several times. part of that times. is because, like, at least in the early 2000s, SpongeBob was fucking everywhere. Yeah. Like, he, like, he was kind of inescapable. Yeah. Like, as, like, not to mention Nickelodeon, which would a- have, like, endless marathons of his show throughout the entire day, but, like, like uh, he was all over the place. Like, he had video games, he had music CDs, he had, like, you know, yeah. books and all sorts of these other things. And, of course, he had the movie, which right. was also really great. Also, I played some of the Spongebob video games. Some of them were actually pretty decent. Yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 some of them aren't that bad, which is kind of surprising, considering most licensed games tend to be pretty terrible. Yes. Yeah, Battle for Bikini Bottom for the on the PS2 and stuff is a pretty mm-hmm. competent uh, Mario 64 Banjo-Kazooie-esque platformer. And it even had a, a little bit of a sequel in the Spongebob movie game which wasn't as good, but it was still alright. It was still pretty solid. Hmm. So, there was a lot of care that went into building up and preserving the Spongebob franchise, both with the cartoons and a lot of the spin-off material, which is something you don't didn't really see with a lot of licenses. Like, I can go back and talk about all of the Fairly Odd Parents games I played. And Fairly Odd Parents, for a long time, was a great cartoon, but like there was, there wasn't as much care. Or, like, yeah, SpongeBob was like, definitely had kind of stuff. Art, yeah, yeah and it, a lot of those long-running cartoons that kind of got birthed in the late and like the tail end of the '90s and early 2000s, like like stuff like SpongeBob, Fairly Odd Parents, and, and shows that kind of ran for years and years on end. Like they suffered the uh, same similar problems in that they kind of flanderized themselves. Yeah, that, that it, especially like, happens. To uh, SpongeBob, yeah, especially yeah. happened to SpongeBob. I'd argue that it almost—it's it, it, almost worse for Fairly Odd Parents. Like, it I is. can't watch anything beyond, say, the third Jimmy Neutron uh, Fairly Odd Parents crossover. That was like, anything the after two thousand six, two thousand seven is just. And then they introduced the baby, and now they had a dog. Oh, we don't talk. We don't talk about poop. I think. No, forget. The most... No, forget. Oh, no, you first have. I was just going to mention, I think what's going to be interesting is to see the future cultural impact of Spongebob. I I know that sounds really weird, but there's all sorts of insidious little jokes that we get from old movies in today's kids' cartoons that, you know, kids won't really understand. A lot of people from our generation won't understand. Oh, uh, yeah. I Um, I really want to wonder if anything from Spongebob will happen 
Is that say two generations from now, I, and SpongeBob is no longer on the air for whatever reason? It, but, see, that that's the thing because SpongeBob, in and of itself, kind of builds itself on a lot of true to form classic comedy tropes and ideas. So it, it's it at least the earlier stuff is probably going to be regarded as more timeless, much of the same vein as like the classic Looney Tunes cartoons, stuff like Tom and Jerry and all that stuff. Like, the, the, like because those were solid in and of their own right mm-hmm. because they d- they weren't dependent on being this is the now, this is what it is. It was just like, no, this is just fun. It, that's just good, honest fun. So would we see, you know, Spongebob references some 20 years from now in future kids programming? I think that's doubtful, largely because Spongebob's still going to be on the air. Most likely. <laughs> Probably. Spongebob the movie number 23. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, so, but a lot, a large problem, like, the longer a show will run, the more it'll kind of become a self-parody or pastiche, like, it's like, hey, remember this thing we did years ago? It's still a thing! So, that's kind of unavoidable, uh, and it's to be expected, and it also, like, Spongebob kind of shifted with the times as far as, you know, general animation storytelling mm-hmm. and, and what was considered funny at the time, because it's, it's a constantly evolving art. So, you could, prob- you could probably track through, well, how many, there's like, what, 14 seasons now? Something like that? Mm-hmm. 14 uh, wow. seasons and two movies? And you could probably track throughout the entire season. You could watch the general changes in animation and the character appearances and the overall writing and humor. And as you go on, it slowly starts devolving to this more kind of gross-out humor and mm-hmm. uh, animation style that's kind of become the norm now- nowadays. But, you know. Yeah, but, yeah, the original... A uh, couple of yeah. seasons of Spongebob were classic. I think we can all agree on that stuff. We all grew up watching them because we had no other choice. <laughs> all right, uh, Miss uh, a- Abby uh, something yeah. French. Um, was what, she, what, what, what are your favorite cartoons growing up? I am, there's a lot, but I think I would stack my ultimate favorite cartoon as, from a, as a kid was Rugrats. Oh, yes. Solid choice, solid Rugrats was fantastic. It's a, such a cute, charming, little silly show where you kind of, it kind of gives you a glimpse of, like, you know, being a kid from a actual, like, baby's perspective. Like, it was cute, all the little words they made up and all the things that they thought. Like, one of the epi- episodes I remember the most where it was really, really foggy and cloudy outside and all the, and the babies thought that their house was a plane... And they had to pull the fan to fly. Oh, yeah. And then, so Tommy basically had a Jimmy, like, Jerry rig a a way for them to pilot the house back down, right? Yeah. Oh, God, that was great. Like, no, because, like, Rugrats was probably one of my favorites growing up, too. (laughs) It only ran for, like, what, six or so seasons, but it had two and a half movies or something like that. Yeah, it it had two. It was also all grown up, which was the Rugrats as uh, uh, all grown up, yeah, sure, whatever. It was, but, a, uh, it was a thing. <laughs> it, it existed. It didn't need to exist. <laughs> but yeah, Rugrats just gave this cute. It was a cute little yeah. show. It's funny, and, and it also knew when to end, though. Yeah, because I like, it because it, it ran for like I I want to say about six or seven years more or less before it finally ended. Yeah, its run Rug, like Rugrats I, ran for fourteen years. It did. It, yeah. Wow. Rug, yeah. Rugrats was from like night was from uh, I'm looking now from August of ninety one to June eighth two thousand four. Wow. Wow. Jesus. Yeah. SpongeBob. But, uh, uh, not SpongeBob. Rugrats honestly went on a little too long. But it didn't feel I, like I, it yeah, did. Yeah, but, but you know, it's interesting that you point that out because. Uh, Rugrats is probably one of the few shows that managed to kind of stay true to its character throughout its entire run. Like, and, I mean, yeah, there were some moments, and, you know, there were, they introduced new characters throughout the run because, you know, you gotta do something to keep it up. Mm-hmm. But, like, it, like, they didn't... Or I should say, they took great care to make sure that they didn't ultimately become a parody of it in and of itself. Yeah. Granted... 14 years of being t- a toddler is kind of excessive, <laughs> but you know what? But that's what was the show to be about, you know, cute baby adventures. 
Yeah. It's also a, a, a freaking master class in doing uh, baby voices and young younger voices and, and voice acting. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. definitely. The voice actors for this show, I know there were a couple of ones that shifted around. Like, I know, like, certain voice act- actresses, except for, like, maybe, like, a few didn't stay on for, for the whole run. But, like, it was a, the, the, all of the actors that were on the show were able to just really capture the feel very well, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think it's also something to be said that, much like SpongeBob had a great movie, Rugrats oh, yeah. also had two really great movies in this movie. And it had that weird spin off uh, crossover with, what, The Wild Thornberry? Yes. Yeah, which was I, not that great of a movie. Hey, uh, I liked it. it like, not as good as the other two, that's though. That's true, it, but it, like, it was so it, cute. I, that probably would have been better if it was just a Wild Thornberries movie, because the Wild Thornberries was actually a pretty good show. I loved the Wild Thornberries. It was a Wild Thornberries movie. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. So, like, it, like, it, like the crossover didn't need to happen. But, mm-hmm. like, it, it had two great movies, and both of them kind of irreparably changed the overall "Quote unquote" plot of the yeah, show because the, the first, the first movie one had Dill, and then yeah, which one gave added Tommy Kimmy. a baby brother, and Kimmy, who was basically, and it was actually probably an early example of showing a. Um, Until, I forget, I forget the term interracial for interracial family. Well, yeah, interracial also, but also, um, oh, I, f- I, there, there's an actual term for this. I'll probably end up remember it like at the tail end of the show, but. Yeah. The, but for like you know having uh, like step parents and all that, there's a term for that kind of family. In laws? No, not in laws. No, it's step, step family. I don't know what you're aiming at. Like there's an uh, like ah uh, whatever. Keep non-nuclear. talking. I'll figure it out. Non nuclear family. Let's go with that. Sure. Because all the other families on that show are nuclear families, except for um, the redheaded di- redheaded kid and just his dad. Yeah, Chucky. 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 But then the Finsters. He, but then his dad marries Kira, and then Kimmy is a stepsister. Yeah, also, I, I appreciate the fact that the Rugrats family were Jewish. Like, when else have we seen a prominent Jewish family in a popular TV show? Yeah, that that's... Never? Yeah, because like oh. they actually took they they took time to both to celebrate both Christmas, which you know you, you had to have a Christmas episode. Yeah, and, and they also took great care to show that you know this is like ha- this is Hanukkah. This is kind of how we celebrate. Yeah, they also had a Kwanzaa episode. With, Who else? With, what with, other show uh, had a Kwanzaa a, episode? With a, a gigantic dreidel on top of their house. It's like, oh god. But yeah, I, I like always appreciate you know the the Passover episode. Because this is finally a nice nod to other cultures. Mm-hmm. And the cool thing was that the all-grown-up sequel cartoon actually did have a few episodes where they flesh out, uh, very specifically, uh, Tommy's uh, Jewish I- Jewish identity. So I thought that was kind of cool, even that though really it's, cool. it's one of the few things I actually remember from the cartoon, because all-grown-up is honestly not that memorable, and I didn't yeah. really watch it that much. Yeah, but you can Ru- definitely tell which cartoon was better. <laughs> Rugrats did a lot of very good things. Yes, it was. It's a great cartoon. It's it's just really great that this was one of the cartoons that Nickelodeon was able to really start with, mm-hmm. along with uh, Ren and Snippy and Doug. Was it? Maybe. Uh, yeah. I think those were the first three big tunes. Um. I know Ren and Stippy was probably was one of the first. I think Doug may have come a little later, though. Mm. Oh my god, Ren, Ren, Ren and Stippy was weird. Doug, Ren and Stippy. Yeah, no, uh, Ren and Stippy, Doug, and Rograts all debuted on the same day, August wow. 9th, 1991. Wow. Honestly, first cartoons. honestly, Doug and Ren and Stippy were so forgettable. I hardly remember anything about them. Doug had some hey. nice moments. I remember watching Doug a lot. Yeah. I don't remember much from Doug, but I remember yes. watching the show yeah. a lot. Yeah. Oh, that, no, wait, no, I remember, I remember the theme song. Everyone remembers the theme song. That was probably, like, the only memorable thing from the show, though, because largely, like, because uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm a bit older than you guys, so I, I've kind of experienced a lot of this stuff more directly. Mm-hmm. But, like, there's, like, Doug was kind of a slice-of-life type of show. It was. 
but it didn't have anything to make it really stand out from other slice of life type shows. It just seemed to be more like an animated version of things like you know what, what was on at the time, like Boy Meets World and stuff like that. Right. But you know, but less you know r- real in the fact that it was an animated show and mm-hmm. it still had some very cartoony elements in it. Right. But yeah, Doug, it existed. Yeah. You know what I find hilarious? Hmm? Uh, you know, when I was a little kid, I mostly remember Doug as a Nicktoon, right? Because its original run was on Nick. But right. Disney, in like, in 96, actually brought the, bought the rights to Doug. So yeah. there's, re- there's seasons run through four of regular Doug, and then there are three seasons of 65 episodes of Disney's Doug. And there were, like, what, like... I, as a kid, like, I was like, just trying to imagine, I was like a little two to three year old trying to wrap my head around the fact that, that, that a cartoon that I liked as a kid from one network just completely got bought out by another network and is now like airing the new episodes on that one. So I could watch like the old reruns on like Nicktoons or Nickelodeon, but then I'd have to go to another channel just to see the rest of the show and. Yeah, it's, just one of those, it's one of those little kid things that it, it, when you're an adult, it's like, oh, it, it just switched networks. Someone else is making it. All right, let's go. But as a kid, it's like, whoa. <laughs> oh, man. Right. You know what that well, reminds me of? It reminds me of that show, um, My Name is Ginger? Ginger? Oh, also, also, also known Ginger, as Ginger. Yeah. As told by Ginger. As yeah. told by Ginger. Yeah. That, that, that was show. kind of a, like, a tween kind of uh, show. I like I, I like that by Ginger. Mm-hmm. It, it, really cool. it was very kind of mature for yeah. what for like the kind of audience it was aimed towards because it was a very much a sort of coming of age type of story. It was. But and, I liked it a uh, lot. Like it only ran for like what three seasons? Or something yeah, it like didn't that. have a yeah, very long run. Sixty episodes. Sixty episodes. Yeah. Um, but it it was it was a good show. I remember watching it. I never really kept up with it as religiously as some of these other shows because mm-hmm. I like. At the end of the day, I think it was more intended for girls than it Probably. was boys. But yeah. like, I remember it was a pretty decent show. It had good story. It had well-fleshed-out characters. The writing was all right. And it was just kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. more slice-of-life type stuff. Yeah, one of the most notable things about the show, well, actually, two of the most notable things, is one is that it's much more continuity-heavy and less about oh, yeah. the comedy and more about the character development and the growth of the characters, which was definitely different from cartoons of the era. Remember, right. this cartoon debuted in 2000. This is pre-Avatar stuff right now. Mm-hmm. and Because av- Avatar, we'll probably dedicate a lot of time just to talk about Avatar later, but uh, Avatar for me was like one of the, like the, like the Western cartoon that really pushed the whole more continuity-driven stuff. Uh, wasn't the first, yeah. but it's definitely yeah. one of the most well-known and popular. But As Told by Ginger was doing it on its smallest scale first. And also the other thing that I remember reading about this during in like Nickelodeon magazine <laughs> back when it came out. This show was one of the one of the major examples, one of the first real examples at the time, of of averting the trope of same outfits that the character wears the same outfit almost in almost every situation, only yeah. situational stuff. In As Told by Ginger uh, the characters are almost consistently changing their outfits. That's which amazing. Ma- which is ma- which not only which took more effort because you know you have to have different animation sheets for all the different outfits and stuff, and have to, and you know you just you don't have as regular of a character. Yeah, design. but that, that but also, also led it to real. its yeah, mm-hmm. it led it to its realism, and I think probably an apt description for it for those of you who probably aren't aware because I don't think it it's ever been on like any sort of rerun before. Um, it, this could probably be best considered as a preteen version of, like, Daria. Oh god, Daria. It's less, it's less, like, less snarky and, do you want to say depressing? Yeah, no, yeah, I think you're da- right. Uh, I don't, I just don't think you, it, you, it's fair to call Daria depressing. It was just, it was much more cynical. Cynical, yes. yeah, that's a good word, that's a good word. Daria yeah. was something else, though, I liked it. Ginger was, as told by Ginger, was definitely more hopeful, more, this is, it, it, things, it more, these, this is, these are things that are happening, these are things that are, might be changing, you're changing, that's okay, but, that sort of thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it was, it, it's a pretty good show, and it's something that, I kind of wish that they, like, 
show more often, at least on reruns or something like that, because I think there's a lot of good lessons that could be gleaned from that show, especially for, like, preteen girls. Mm-hmm. But let's, let's go ahead and take a sidestep so I can talk about one of my favorite cartoons growing up. Uh, it's a bit uh, screamy. Um, Invader Zim. Invader Zim was something else, and I loved Invader Zim so much. Oh my god, Invader Zim was the shit growing up, but I just, like, what one of my greatest regrets is, like, it only aired on, like, the weirdest time slot. It was, like, Sunday late morning, like, when when the show would ha- air new episodes for whatever reason, because Nintendo, or Nintendo, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the Nintendo curse you <laughs> because Nickelodeon, like, did not... One, they didn't understand the show and who it's supposed to be for. Yeah. And they also had a lot of problems with it because it was really kind of out there. A little bit. And th- that wasn't the kind of programming anybody was doing at the time. Right. And so, like, uh, so they, they did their best to kill the show. It only ran for, like, two and a half seasons. And um, so they ended up relegating it to like one of the worst time slots for a cartoon show, being like late Sunday morning. Cause, so I remember like I would be able to watch like half of an episode of Invader Zim, but then I'd have to go to church, so I couldn't finish like any real episode. So like for the longest time, I I had these gaps in my Invader Zim canon. And it wasn't until, like, like six or seven... About six years after the show went off the air and they finally got around to releasing them all on DVD that my sister, she actually bought them all. And I just... That was probably the first show I ever binged-watched. I should have binge. Yeah, but, I mean, that... God, that show was out there. Like, it had one of the... Probably the loudest scripts ever produced. Because Zim, who was the protagonist of the show, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Uh, screamed every single line. That he did. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think I should really have to go into too much detail because it's kind of a cult classic and it makes the rounds on the internet a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for those of you who aren't aware, since it only ran from like 2001 to 2003, it, Invader Zim was about a reject alien who was more or less quote unquote assigned to come to Earth and learn about its weaknesses so that way his his home planet, the, the uh, Urkin race, could come and invade it. Much to his, like, he doesn't know this, but they just kind of sent him off to some backwater parts of the universe just to kind of get rid of him because he's kind of a fucking nuisance. And it basically shows his misadventures in trying to more or less conquer the Earth single-handedly in his own inept way. And his rival, uh, who is Dib, who is something of a psychotic and uh, okay. kind of a, a paranormal nut job, and like he's the, he's the person who believes in Bigfoot and aliens and the Loch Ness monster and all that, and he's he's got proof, man. <laughs> He's got proof. I've seen it. And then he does have proof. <laughs> yeah, and he does have proof, but he nobody believes him. And I can't blame that nobody believes him because the world he exi- lives in is the most batshit insane place ever put to TV. Yeah. Oh, God, Invader Zim's great. I think I'm going to watch Invader Zim after we get done with this. <laughs> you like Invader Zim? The comic's coming out. Is oh. a comic coming out? Yeah, yeah that's right. it's coming out on July 8th of this Shit, year. Shit, I gotta get it. So there, if you like Invader Zim, there you go. I was one of those kids who saw Invader Zim, was like, what the heck am I watching? And didn't watch much more of it. Aww. Yeah, probably. I was not in the intended age group for this show. No sorry. No, it was very really much so. intended for, like, probably teenagers, young teenagers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Nickelodeon didn't know, doesn't know who teenagers are, <laughs> <laughs> so that that was it was doomed from the start. Never mind the fact that it's probably one of the darkest shows they've ever produced. A little bit. All right. So that's that. We've kind of talked about uh, some of our favorites growing up. Let's talk about some other great 
uh, cartoons that have come around since then. Uh, Dakota, you mentioned uh, Avatar, yeah. The Last Airbender, and yeah. I, I think it would be remiss if we didn't talk yeah. about that right. sub. But now, t- to be fair, Avatar still technically counts as my childhood. Like, I was eight to nine when the show first aired, and I yeah. was still in middle school talking yeah. about it with friends yeah. when the show was still airing, but Man, Avatar The Last Airbender, probably the most... I don't want to talk hyperbole here, because I just gushed about Spongebob earlier, but this is arguably the most important Nicktoon. Not in terms of its cultural impact, necessarily, Mm -hmm. but just what it showed for for the medium. I wouldn't say it's an important Nicktoon as much as it is an important mark in Western animation in general. Oh, definitely. That's even better than what I said. Well, the reason why I, I'm taking it a step further is because of this. For one, it had a more serious scale of story mm-hmm. and overall like world building because it, it 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 created and established an entire universe unto it itself, much similar to stuff like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and all that. It had a fully fleshed world that it could fantasy world that it could it exist in, mm-hmm. and like most, uh, at least television based cartoons they didn't really do stuff like that yeah they had like this this takes place in some make believe country or a make believe version of earth or whatever but like m- everything was pretty much self contained like there was no grand storytelling for the entire thing and A- avatar is probably going to be one of the f- if not the first but probably the most successful uh example of grand arc based storytelling because before then the only place you can get that sort of storytelling in animation was Japanese anime mm-hmm. because they like a lot of Japanese anime they'd have big serious drawn out arcs of like multiple seasons all to tell one self contained story and avatar pretty much had that it was all one story spread across three seasons and then it eventually got a sequel which will probably get to in a second but it it was also a a much more sophisticated example of animation um it it was also a very much more sophisticated example of writing for children's programming and uh it was probably one of the most serious uh cartoons to air at the time that wasn't like you know sort of slice of life type stuff I think it really opened up the door to allow for both continuity within Western cartoons, because more and more cartoons have more uh, continuity than before, and it also, I think, allowed for cartoons to discuss more serious subjects as well, because a lot of times when you look at cartoons like Fairly Odd Parents and Spongebob, like, they're great and all, but... But they're cartoons. They're cartoons. Well, not the cartoons, let's not say that, that, because this Avatar's cartoon too, but they're purely humor. Yeah, the purity of humor cartoons are purely meant to entertain, whereas Avatar definitely took the medium and turned it into something that says, okay, yeah, this is a cartoon, but it can also teach lessons. It can, like, show different morals and show things aren't always black and white, and, like, it added for more complexity within Western animation style that simply wasn't there before, even within Mm -hmm. Slice of Life cartoons. Yeah, because uh, within Avatar... Uh, you had three seasons in which you have your protagonist, Aang, who was the quote-unquote avatar of the series, who basically had to come to grips with the fact that he is more or less the one, and master his powers all in time to stop uh, the big bad from taking over the world. And... We had never seen anything like that in Western animation because, I mean, anytime there's like a big take over the world plot kind of show, it's usually thwarted within an episode or two. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or small story arcs. Or it's an anime. Yeah, or it's an anime. And here, not, not only did you have, like, that was the entire point of the show, but you had three seasons to do it. Uh, so it, it allowed for you know greater uh, uh, exploration of character development and you know exploration of writing and you could actually display more clear passages of time 
Because what the the original show took place over the over the span of how long? Of a year. A of, year. A year. Yeah, just about. Yeah. Just about. Less right, than and, a little bit less than a year because they had because yeah. you went through the winter solstice and then you had to get through the summer one. So it was less than a and year. And then a little, and I think a little bit after. I, yeah, yeah, just about, just about. Right, and each episode basically more or less took place over a day or two. Mm-hmm. Or even a sp- or even longer, it depends. But that was yeah. the thing. You, it, it was so paced in a way to feel like there was a lot of progression and growth and time passing, even if it was only just a year. Right, and then uh, so it had three years, three seasons of great, great storytelling all around and all that, and then it went off the air. People were rejoiced and were kind of sad because, you know, oh, Nickelodeon lost their greatest show ever. <laughs> Which it arguably is. It mm. might Ar- be. Like I said, Cri- it critically, arguably. Critically the greatest show. Yeah. The uh, it, it's, it's arguably one of the, it's still probably one of the And best, then, the uh, a few years ago, uh, it finally got a sequel in, um, uh, I forget what, what is the it Legend called? Korra. Legend of Korra. Legend of Korra. Yeah, Korra. Korra. Right. Korra. I've ac- Korra. I've actually never seen the new show, mostly because I was kind of late to the whole Avatar bandwagon. I really didn't start watching it till about just after the second season got started. Uh. I mean, it was a great show. I I I knew I probably missed out in that first season, but like it wasn't a, it like the first Avatar seemed pretty competently well done in a self-contained story and the legend of Korra when it came out I watched like the first two episodes and it just felt more of like sort of the hobbit to the lord of the rings like it's great but Not I mean, great. come on yeah. <laughs> here's, here's the thing Korra has very very inconsistent quality and a lot of that is, is due to how it was envisioned Originally, the series was meant to be just a 12-episode miniseries. Just a one-season thing, showed this one conflict, and just be done with it. They ju- The main two creators of Avatar said, Okay, this is just going to be a small thing. Let's just have us two work on it just to make it simpler. That didn't quite work out. Um, the, 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 the show was certainly popular. It got a lot of views, but... And a lot of fan response, but there was a lot of controversial elements mm-hmm. that probably would have been ironed out if they had either more writers or more time to flesh things out. Right. Like they spent a lot, a good chunk of the of the emotional, of the emotional pacing of the show on a love triangle when they could have focused more on the villain plot or on like what they're doing. Or just on the, all the group growing as friends, but no, they decided to focus on the love triangle, and that really, for a lot of people, damaged their perception of the show. I know it did for me. And, me. and then see, yeah. And then we had, uh, and then the Nickelodeon said, "Okay, we're going to give you three more seasons." But rather than really have starting from that point, rather from the end of season one, it technically does follow it continuity wise, but. It doesn't try to really focus on the aftermath of that sort of conflict. Rather, it decides it's going to do something. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, uh, there was a. Um, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm leaving that in. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. I hate you guys. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so yeah, anyway, Legend of Korra. Back, back to Korra. Um, season two mostly went off and did its own sort of plot, and season three and four did too. But we'll get to those in a bit. And I watched a bit of season two, and it still has a lot of the rough parts, elements of season one, and how it focuses on the love triangle and a bit of character derailment. And, and, yeah, I, I don't know. I, that was when I personally quit the show. And a, a lot of people probably did, 
and a lot of people mostly quit for season one. Some sort of same for season two because it didn't really feel. But then seasons three and four come out, and, and from better. what I've heard, they're t completely solid, really great seasons. Almost as good, almost as good, if not on par, with the original Avatar. And they're also more intertwined continuity-wise in terms of the growth and progression of the characters, even mm -hmm. if there's not an overarching villain. So that was a little more interesting so yeah. but it yeah. means that Korra had a very inconsistent quality yeah it, it started did. off it did. really rough but then got really good and it's a shame that I have to say that only half of the show is truly great yeah and that is good as the original because well that's to be fair like it, free. too bad only half of it's good it, to, to be fair like I mean it's really hard to follow up on something that kind of got it right in the first place like you yeah. you catch lightning in a bottle once do you really expect to do it again i mean there are very very few examples in any sort of medium where a sequel or otherwise a follow-up is as great or better than it's the original mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think they could have did it they could have had the consistent four seasons it, 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 it sounds how to was, me how it was structured and how it was pitched and all of that and how they originally went about it and how they were sort of unprepared for it and they, that they caused them to really not get their bearings until halfway through yeah which, it sounds to me like it like however it was originally conceived is just what it should have been otherwise it should have just gone back to the writing board entirely yeah. but you know it's animation you're on a time schedule where something gets approved and then the producers say yeah we're gonna make multiple seasons of this uh, oh oh okay <laughs> uh well uh, and then they go to, to disneyland for an episode you know so it's like there, there's there it, it's one of the examples of limits within the medium you're working i think that kind of derailed the show for a better yeah it derailed the show early on the last two seasons do a lot of great things with its characters and its plot, and especially how it handles the emotional growth and development of the main character. And uh, this is going to be important more to some people than it is to others, but it's also probably the first cartoon I can think of that show, or, or like, I believe, or at least, definitely the first kids cartoon, but one of the first cartoons that showed a that showed a lesbian couple of two bisexual characters mm -hmm. co coming into a romance at the end of the show and it being like fully canon. And this is after those two characters were opposites in a love triangle. You know, trying to vie for the affections of like one of the male characters. Yeah, some douche, so some it's douche such, guy. Uh, and and so then they, they decide, you know what, screw it, you know what, yeah. cut out the middleman. I want you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's such a whiny dumpling. In terms of That's literally the only way a love triangle should end ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Screw the guy. Once again, I have to emphasize, it's such a one eighty compared to what we what we had before. Mm -hmm. uh, like the first few seasons focus on pointless, um, too much on sort of pointless, sort of melodrama that involved love triangle rather than focusing on what's Mm -hmm. Later on, it's more organically weaved into the story, much like it was with the original Avatar. Are and it was able to do something that was just revolutionary. I mean, we can, yeah, but the, 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 it's, it's it, once again, it's a shame that I have to say only half of the show is truly good. Yeah, ta because talking that last about half is truly great. Yeah, but talking about the whole ultimate reveal and you know one of the first lesbian couple show in western animation at least on television anyway um i remember because like on my facebook feed at various places online that had you know fan communities or whatever like th that was the only thing that they would talk about for like weeks on end but like the general consensus i was getting is that one it kind of comes out of nowhere and two because of that, I kind of got the impression that it was just kind of, well, why don't we make them lesbians? Yeah. Well, I feel like that's the, I feel like that's the, that's a debate for another yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, granted, I've never seen the show, so I don't have to watch it for myself. I, right. But. I'm not going to talk about it too much here because I haven't seen it. But and there's other cartoons things. mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. One, from from people I've talked to, who were fans of the show. 
it was sort of subtly hinted at in the in seasons from season three and especially season four. Though one of the major problems being that because this was a kids' network, they couldn't just outright uh, right, say things or like show the kiss or mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Which but wait, know, wasn't it on online or something like that? It like, was online. That was one of the problems with the terror time. Oh uh, yeah. As it was a it was a digital screwed, series. Screwed over. Season well, three, to be fair, Nickelodeon's got a great three. history of screwing over great shows. You know, yes. you know <laughs> wait a minute. If we're going to talk about a great show being screwed over, Devin can finally say some, oh, say some peace. Boy, oh my go. goodness. Okay, so, first problem. Okay, first of all, title of the cartoon, Motor City. If you haven't seen it yet, please check it out. It's Motor City is fantastic. I uh, have no idea what you're talking about. I know, which is the problem. <laughs> yes. The first but problem continue. is that it was shown on Disney XD, which is one of those, oh, like, God. HBO channels that you kind of have to get extra. D so X Disney XD? Why? Why Why was it? Because they were trying to screw it over on purpose. They were trying to screw it over on purpose, and they were constantly changing the show times. Basically, what you have here is post-apocalyptic world, where the mm -hmm. fact that it's post-apocalyptic is suddenly hinted at, and becomes a larger and larger point of the show, but it's focused on the city of Detroit, Motor City, where... Oh, that's your first problem. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, true, but unsurprisingly, let's be real, Detroit becomes taken over by this man named Kane, who turns the... who builds a second Motor uh, Detroit on top of the first one. <laughs> Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is this super clean white lines, like, and the, and the tagline is that they give up, they, they take safety over freedom. So it becomes kind of like this weird utilitarian society, whereas the people who want to live So free, it's basically modern day America. Yeah! Pretty much. <laughs> and oh. the people live underneath the second Detroit are the motor citizens who are constantly being What the attacked. hell? Is this Gotham? No. <laughs> uh, give it a chance. Give it a chance. Um, and Kane is constantly attacking the second city because he just wants it gone. He doesn't care if he kills everyone. Well, his first problem was putting a city on top of an already existing city. Like, it's not just gonna go away. That's kind of your foundation, dude. A little bit. <laughs> It, it, it's kind of ridiculous in some places, like, but you made end, your own problem. He kind of did, but it's produced by a company called a uh, Titmouse, and it's very oh those guys. <laughs> yeah, they make, those guys. They make shows. They yeah, do make of shows. varying quality. <laughs> but um, honestly, it's simply got amazing animation. The the friendships are very organic feeling. Like all the relationships within the show are very organic feeling, and. Even though it only has two seasons, one se technically just one season. Technically one season, more like a season and a half. It feels very, very organic. The characters progress at a very natural rate, and, and then as it long just stops. And another problem with the show is that they aired out of order. Yeah. So. The oh bigger yes, like a lot of a lot of the uh, auxiliary channels nowadays have that sort of problem because you have like the Nicktoons Network, Disney XD. And I think Cartoon Network's got one now, where any of the programming that's original to those channels, they just... What, what's continuity, guys? Is, we're going to yeah, start with yeah. the sixth episode. Pretty <laughs> much. So, like, if you watch in order, the progression feels very natural. The character development feels very natural. And it's a very well-animated show. So well-animated. It, it's so well-animated. It's, it's honestly amazing. It, it uh, combines the um, 3D animation and 2D animation almost seamlessly. It's amazing. Yeah. And well, honestly, I would recommend checking it out. It's available yeah. on iTunes for if you want to go be a oh. legal route. <laughs> legal, legal route. Well, but, um, that, that's, that's, that's uh, your first problem. You, you have to pay for this show. Uh, <laughs> you can find the epi episodes online somewhere. And that's where we're going to leave it at. All right. Yes. <laughs> uh, so other, I think we can shift gears to more modern cartoons because I think... I want to talk know, about I, some... I, I, I think it's becoming more and more of an acceptable trend, at least people within our age, the college goers of today, kind of read, readily admit, yeah, yeah, I watch cartoons still. It's like some of them are really good. Steven Universe. So, I was about to say Steven Universe because there was a rather big thing that managed to crawl across my Facebook feed over the past couple of days. Steven Bomb 2. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, Steven Universe is an original show for Cartoon Network, right? Yes. yes. By, by, by uh, Rebe- Rebecca, Rebecca Sugar. Who was an original writer on A Metro Time. Yeah. Uh, Cartoon Network, in and of itself, ha- has a very good and long history with great original cartoon programming. Mm-hmm. Because you have stuff like Courage the Cowardly Dog, and, um, like, oh, crap, I... Names are failing me left and right today. Hmm. Uh, Codename 5? Codename, uh, Codename Kids Next Door. Door. Codename Another Next fantastic Door. Right. show. Alright, okay. Uh, that show's like 10 years old, so give me a break. <laughs> uh, but like, they have a long history of putting out great programming, and I think they kind of hit a second golden age these days. They have. Because you've got shows like Steven Universe, which is rapidly growing in critical acclaim. You also have other cult favorites, which are and shows like Adventure Time and uh, a few others because they've got like 20 shows live right now. There's, yeah, this regular show, The Amazing World of Gumball. And Gumball's actually kinda... really funny. And I thought Gumball we... stopped. No, it Gumball's did? still going. Gumball's it's still popular. going. Ah. But, and of course, how can we forget Adventure Time? Probably of course. Probably started off this whole renaissance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Adventure Time um, is... Rather curious example in, in cartoons because it it is probably a clear indication of a general shift in comedy because it, it takes a much more postmodern approach which a lot of television shows and movies are going to take like they like because in comet in, in classic comedy comedy sort of telling more or less. Um, you set up absurd situations, and the absurd situation in and of itself is the joke. Like, like look at like you know old old shows like I Love Lucy, classic cartoons like Looney Tunes, Tom and Jerry, and all that stuff. Like, th- like the fact that all this wild crap was happening was the joke. Mm-hmm. And you'd have the straight man to kind of like the like to represent your reality, and so you'd have that juxtaposition. But nowadays, comedy in and of itself has kind of shifted to, like, you know this really weird thing? Yeah, that's really absurd in in and of itself. But then they take that in its stride and then try to top it? That's kind of what Adventure Time is. A little bit. Cartoon Uh, Network also did something interesting um, last year, I want to say, when they aired Over the Garden Wall. Yeah. Because that was very out of nowhere and new, where they were like, "Let's take this mini series by Patrick Patrick McHale or Patrick yeah. Hale." Uh, Patrick McHale, another adventure. Patrick, Mc- yeah, and he made this extraordinary ten episode mini series, where in ten episodes you instantly got a bunch of characters, a whole entire interesting world and concept. The animation was gorgeous. The music was fantastic. I have rewatched this thing like six times. That's how much I like it. It helps that it's a very, very short soap. That too. Mini, that, that, that's a mini series. That too, but it's so good. And that Cartoon Network is getting all this like really amazing show that out of nowhere in comparison to, to Nickelodeon, where they're kind of yeah. farting around. It's also one of those mini series that has a very interesting ability to be very. Rewatchable. Yeah, you watch like, it once, and you don't really understand what's happening the first time around. But the second and third time you watch it, you're like, "Oh my god, this thing shows up three episodes later! What the heck are you doing? You need to step on that, I don't know, weird bug now before it yeah. screws you over later." There's a lot of foreshadowing and things you can notice the more you re- re- mm. uh, rewatch the series, which is what makes it so interesting. Every new, usually every new watch, something else clicks. Right, and so we're going to go ahead and keep going on the trend with more modern, current cartoons. Yeah. Uh, staying on Cartoon Network, I know you're kind of dying to talk about Steven Universe. I love Steven Universe. Oh, I love same. it so much. I, this is probably an interesting subject for me to have chosen, because I have not kept up with most Western animation for like the past five or six years. And Steven Universe started airing, what, like two years ago? Or what? End of 2013. Yeah. Okay, so about two... Okay, so just over one year ago, yeah, then. Yeah, about a year and a half. Yeah, about a year right. and a half. Right. Um, I have no idea what it's about, uh, but I know it's very much in line with a lot of Cartoon Network's lineup in, in terms of animation style and overall sense of humor. Mm-hmm. 
um, being very absurdist, yeah. at a least. Gra- a bit more grounded than, say, regular show or Adventure Time. Yeah. Yeah, but as so. far as I understand, they make up for that level of groundedness for just completely off-the-wall plot. Yeah. Like, well, any... Ep- what you mean by off-the-wall. Yeah. But any episodes they have that would count as, like, filler are usually really funny and silly. Not to mention that they usually come back later that too, as yeah. being important. Like the only the only episode I genuinely do not like is the Grunkle Sam uh, Uncle Grandpa crossover. That episode, was an fool's joke, regardless. Which thank God, and it was. it's also not canon. Yeah, yeah, thank God. But, it, but speaking still of hated. Grunkle Stan, Gravity Falls is also we'll a to- fantastic we'll- example of a modern cartoon. We're not done. We're not I know, done with Steven. I know. But that's what we're going going to next. Is my oh, point. Are we just gonna go like backwards? You're gonna start with Steven Universe and finally make our way back to Adventure Time. Anyway, Probably. but let's continue on Steven Universe and why it's so yes. good. Um. All right. Where would I start? Uh, okay. First. All right. Off, g- general summary of the show. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, who wants to do that? I will. Go for it. Okay. Boy, Steven, Steven Universe main character. Okay. First of all, is he or is he not? The living embodiment of the universe. No. Uh, unfortunately, it, no. Is he the son of Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was once known as Mr. Universe? No, no but his father is known universe. as Mr. Universe. So is Greg Universe a bodybuilder? Um, no. he probably wishes he could be. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but Steven Universe is the very first human gem baby. Baby, basically. The f- offspring. Uh, Gems. Words in sequence. Gems, crystal gems, are an alien race from a homeworld planet far away. We don't know the name of it yet. We Krypton. Just it. It's just called Homeworld. It's the gem homeworld, yes. It's the gem homeworld. Who are on this planet for a reason you don't discover until season two. Mm-hmm. Naturally. So I won't go into But it, it hints progressively that it's a very dark, dangerous reason that they're here because of something horrible that happened. Yeah, by near the near se- near the end of season one, you'll sort of know, and start, shit will start to hit the fan. Yeah. But until then, it's a slow buildup of Steven discovering his gem powers and sh- being and like what it truly means. So, to be so the does Steven world. universe have to save said universe? Essentially, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is he the chosen one? Arguably, I, I wouldn't depends say on your he's point the chosen view. one. He doesn't have chosen one, like chosen one, stresses or abilities. They treat him like a child because he is a child, yeah, which like, is a very interesting concept. Because yes, he yeah. does have chosen one characteristics, but he's also a child who is treated as a child and isn't looked down upon for being a child. Yeah. Well, like personally, I I, I choose to treat all children like elk. <laughs> so there's that. Okay. okay. You all know you all know you're just saying that to make unintentional humor value out of this cartoon. It's not working. <laughs> but mostly what this show is about at its core is different family units. Mm-hmm. Like, Steven, for example, has three moms and a dad. And, like, there's so no... So they're polyamorous. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they're not polyamorous. Whoa! Well, that, well, that's, kind of <laughs> that's a different conversation, actually. <laughs> but uh, um, it, at its core, it's about family, what family means, and creating your own family units. Like, there's not a single nuclear family within the show. I mean, All, I mean that's progressive. Technically, one, but which, which family? Which family is nuclear? Connie? Connie's family. Connie, Connie's family. But Go that's the point. That. They're yeah. the comparatively yeah. normal, quote unquote, family. Yeah, the comparatively normal family compared to all these different family units mm-hmm. and how they support each other and take care of each other and like help each other learn and grow. And it also shows that adults can and are wrong at times. And that that's okay. And that's, I think, it's a very important thing to have in children's shows. Because so many children's shows show adults as just these un- either unfeeling figures or as bumbling fools. Mm-hmm. When really adults are just people. And this yeah. sh- show has a really good balance of having the adults be both responsible adults and as being people who make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and unsurprisingly, with the show with this kind of description... One of the strongest parts of it are the characters and how they really feel fleshed out. 
Definitely. Uh, a big point of the show is that even though you would think that the that the gems are some super perfect, amazing, super special, awesome alien warrior people, the most striking thing about them is how human they are in their emotions and their res in their emotions and their responses and their actions. Even though they are a essentially aliens. And, and have different biology from humans and different behaviors and cultures from humans and that sort of level of strong characterization then tends to spread to the rest of the characters uh, like how Greg isn't just the, just the fat bumbling father he's actually very supportive and nurturing side of the family and Cotty's not just the traditional standard human helper character she gets fleshed out a lot and all of the side characters get a little bit of their own little stories and their arcs that tie into making the world feel more real. Definitely. It's just, another thing I have to praise about the show is that it has, it really feels like it's planned out. And it really feels like there's a unified sense of what they want to do, of what all of the writers want to do. And how they are going to grow that world, and how is it going to progress? Obviously, all of the writers have their own sort of styles and storytelling strengths. That's going to be apparent for every show. But unlike an Adventure Time, where it feels like the show really changed tone, almost it's sort of, sort of, it's sort of a natural evolution, but it also feels kind of abrupt. How it went from standard SpongeBob S you were kind of doing to a very philosophical, deep show. This one feels like the tone just evolves. It builds upon itself. In that regard, it kind of reminds me of Avatar, how in terms of just what it could show for animation, because it, 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 it tells a story, it has a good mix of humor, and also, you know, serious moments, and it's a show that constantly builds upon itself and slowly reveals its world. It feels like there is a world, as soon as you're watching the first few episodes, that there is a world here. And that we just don't, and similar to how we tell Steven, is like, we just don't know all of it yet. Mm -hmm. And it's revealed in such a, such a masterful way, even though, the, even though these are like 11 minute episodes, how they're still able to manage tone and character and plot is just incredible. I think that what, I think um, an interesting comparison to make at this point is with the 11 minute episodes is compared to other shows that have similar concepts but different pacings mm -hmm. um for example going back to adventure time uh adventure time has the same kind of setup where 11 minutes you show an episode it's done it's in the past but the pacing is rapidly different much different it's much different like the pacing yeah, in adventure event the Adventure person? Time always comes across as, like, there's, like, kind of two or three simultaneous uh, stories that they're trying to cram into there, and none of them actually are, like, satisfactorily ended. Exactly. Like, it, it, like, it just kind of, like, stops and it's like, well, that's it for way. now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Steven Universe focuses, like, you don't, you never switch perspective. It's always from Steven's perspective. And the episodes, even though they're only 11-minute 11, 11 episodes, like, I've never walked away from an episode feeling like it was only 11 minutes. It's always felt like a full half-hour yeah, episode. Definitely. Yeah. Like, very rarely will I have to say that an episode, that I wish I had an episode last a minute or two longer. And that's a feeling I got consistently with a lot of lot of Adventure Time's weaker episodes. Mm -hmm. Either this was, this, this needed like an extra minute or two just to be really strong, or this probably could have been trimmed down. For the most part, Steven Universe's plot and pacing are just right. Definitely. And it and once again, it helps that everything feels so unified in terms of where it wants to go next, in terms of how all the writers are, and also how and just how everyone's portrayed. And like everything feels like it's building and it's cons it's consistent, but not like in the sense that everyone's like a static character. It feels like there is something really planned here. Once again, it's very similar to the feeling I got with Avatar: The Last Airbender. Even though they're structured very differently, there does feel, there there is that same sort of consistency and level of world building and character depth that are, are, are in both shows. Even though they're handled completely differently, they're almost mm -hmm. like two sides of the same coin. And building, I love it for it. Building off the idea that Steven Universe is definitely very meticulously planned. 
like, I recently started rewatching the series, and I realized that there has there's never been one thing mentioned that wasn't important at some point later. Like, one of the very early earliest episodes, it's like episode two or three, mentions a red eye, which is a giant floating red eye in the sky that comes mm-hmm. to Earth. I mean, they don't know they don't mention where it comes yeah. from, but it's, it's mentioned. Two. Yeah, it was episode two, and it was mentioned again. Way 30 later. Se- 30 some episodes later and you yeah. realize and you're like oh shit like, you're the you're, very end of season one yeah and you realize that this whole big universe world has been developing in the background away from where Steven can see it this entire time and it's always kind of hinted at that things are happening w- while Steven isn't there which is very interesting because usually shows are very much like things are only developing as the main character can see it but there are certain episodes that hint that no, things are happening where Steven can't see it. There are things happening in the background, and it's going to be important. Yep. For example, <clears throat> in one episode, Steven g- gains the temporary ability to see parts of the future. And you see the Crystal Gems interacting with each other, doing something important that Steven interrupts and ruins it, and that's one of the possible features. And it, it's really, really big hint before the big reveal at the end of season one that there's something big going on. We don't know what it is yet, but it's important and it's big and it makes the entire world feel very fleshed out, very real, very big. Right! Okay! (laughs) I also want to talk about Gravity Falls. Uh, Gravity Falls, um, sure... Gravity Falls. Make it, make it fast, because we're kind of running over limit here. Yeah, I know. We'll end with Gravity Falls. What Gravity Falls does for me is it brings back the thematic elements of Courage the Kelly Dog that it mixes this perfect blend of horror and humor so well. The comedy is, like, well done. Like, when I first started hearing about this show, my interest was, like, I was like, all right, I'll watch the first few episodes. And I, like, had so many several laugh-out-loud moments that... At one point, my mom was like, what is making you laugh so hard? Because that's, like, how genuinely funny this show felt to me. It, like, all the, like, a lot of the jokes are so well done. But then when it suddenly takes that tone to, like, a more, like, serious, creepy edge, it does it so well. Like, it doesn't feel like it's forced or anything. You feel like, oh, this is actually, you know, creepy because, you know, it's a paranormal setting bringing back a whole paranormal aspect of, like, Courage or Kelly Dog, where, you know, the basis of the show is these two twins, Dipper and Mabel, are sent to Gravity Falls, Oregon for the summer. But, you know, you know, creepy, weird things happen. Dipper finds this journal talking about, like, really mysterious and creepy monsters and wildlife that live in the town and paranormal things go on. But as it goes on, things start stacking up to this very, very grand, big, overall, like, tone where things build up to actually realize that there's just a little bit more going on than just your general run-of-the-mill paranormal town. If anyone else wants to add in stuff, they can. Okay. (laughs) Very, very thoughtful. It's another one. It's another show in the string of very continuity-heavy sh- cartoons that have come out recently. They mm-hmm. came out not too long before *Secret Universe*. Right. It's it's actually a, a Disney cartoon, Disney and Disney XD. It's like they're probably their main Golden. cartoon of this era. Besides, yeah. it's Phineas and Ferb recently ended, which is also another great, great not oh, as yeah. continuity-heavy, but also a very sort of a blend of like the SpongeBob and Family Guy, but less dark. But, and well, also less cynical and more mm-hmm. about the relationships rather than uh, rather than having humor based off simply taking the piss out of other characters. But we don't have a lot of time. But Grand yeah, Nicole's great show. Fantastic! Um, like you should seriously watch it if you haven't. Part of me to keep up with because it's not the eleven minute episode stand that's becoming standard for many characters. Yeah. it is the twenty two minute format. But, but it does it so show. well. It's still a really good show. Um, okay, worth checking. Yeah. Right, so we're going to end this off with, uh, ironically, Dakota mentioned something about it just now, with Phineas and Ferb, which is probably one of my favorite uh, modern cartoons to ever come out. Um, the uh, the general premise behind Phineas and Ferb is that you have two boys, Phineas and Ferb, because that's the show, the name of the show, guys. Really? <laughs> 
Um, and basically, the, the general premise is that these two boys, who are brothers, stepbrothers, uh, basically try to stave off boredom by just doing anything. Right? Pretty mm -hmm. much. And it's... It, so it's a it's a kind of a take on you know classic summer uh, comedy shows like you know kind of stuff like it, uh, much closer to stuff like you know kind of like Rocket Power and a lot of those other kinds of older late '90s early 2000s cartoons where it's just kind of like kids being kids, man. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it kind of jacks it up a notch by making these two. Uh, just total engineering geniuses and like anything they set their mind to they'll do it in stupidly grand fashion like they don't do anything half-assed and they'll they'll basically go 10 steps beyond what any competent adult would be able to do mm -hmm. uh, and it's interesting because the show actually has like each episode has like three or four plots going on at once because you'll have the main plot with Phineas and Ferb and their circle of friends basically having their summertime fun. You'll have a, a, a subplot in their older sister, Candace, basically trying to prove to her parents that, you know, they are technically, quote-unquote, misbehaving, you know. And so she'll often go off running after them, whom the parents in and of themselves are off doing their own thing. Sometimes having an adventure of their own in, in an adult way or whatever, <laughs> right. and all that. And then meanwhile, while all that's going on, is they have a pet platypus because it's a platypus. Like, what else are you going to have for a pet these days? Uh, who's secretly a secret agent who works for this world organization that's made up of animals who are secret agents. And he's basically assigned to constantly thwart the efforts of a mad genius named Doofenshmirtz uh, from his plot to take over the tri-state area because the world is too big and he has to start small. <laughs> and and gotta start somewhere. Gotta start somewhere. And m more often than not, they'll all intertwine in some way. Sometimes it's very minor, other times it's very major. But they're all self-contained in an 11-minute format. They're, every now and then they'll have their special double-length episodes or like the made-for-TV movies and all that stuff. But at the very core of the show, um, and probably a critical element, is each episode has an original song in it. And they are great. Steven Universe also has a lot of great songs. I forgot to mention that. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, uh, a pedigree from her time in Adventure Time, where she wrote, where Sugar wrote most of the songs mm -hmm. on the show. Right. I haven't heard any of them, but Phineas and Ferb, like from the get go, it was music was always going to be a big part of the thing, and part of a lot of the overall humor and joy from the show comes from the fact that they are uh, totally unafraid of making all sorts of references that they know. None of the kids watching the show could possibly understand, but the parents will. Because I remember uh, when watching the show, um, they actually more or less did a recreation of the pilot episode, in which the pilot episode, they was like, let's build a roller coaster, guys, and they build a roller coaster. You know, so some two years later, they decide, well, let's do it again, but make it a musical episode, guys. Oh, God. <laughs> and so, so the entire episode was a musical episode, and the first number... And I literally referenced at least six different musicals. Uh, Singing in the Rain, Cats, Les Miserables, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, and um, a couple others that are, that are slipping my mind right now. But, like, all within the span of, like, 15 seconds. That's impressive. Yeah, no, like, it all, and that was just one song. And so, it, it, and it's actually surprisingly very continuity heavy because things that happened like two seasons ago will somehow be, either become relevant or just pop up again as just, you know, kind of like a one off line. Hmm. And uh, not, it, it's more obvious with the B plot with uh, Perry and Doofenshmirtz because a lot of their interactions, like, are kind of dedicated to showing their growing relationship because as the show so eloquently puts it they're not so much mortal enemies but more like frenemies okay uh it because like P 
Perry is fully uh, aware of the fact that Doofenshmirtz is, while very talented and capable, is ultimately I incompetent at ever really accomplishing his goals. But it becomes, it, it gets to a certain point in the relationship where it's like, it becomes so much of a routine that they're that they build an almost sort of weird friendship out of it. Like Doofenshmirtz knows at the end of the day, like yeah, I'm gonna get defeated. Perry's gonna win or whatever. We're gonna we're gonna go through the thing. But then they they end up deriving some sort of uh, enjoyment out of almost more or less role playing and, and a sort of parody of what they originally were. And. But going back to the core, to the probably one of the best parts of the entire show was the songs within it because every every episode has an original song for it, and they could range from anything being pretty self-contained, you know, this is what's happening in the moment, yeah, you know, pretty original music, to flat-out homages, pastiches, parodies of like typical '80s pop hits, typical '70s pop hits, you know, spooky horror. Uh, t style songs and even going so far as to um, using the songs to highlight the absurdity of the situation they're in but ultimately summing up but yeah it's a cartoon so just roll with it um, yeah so like Dakota said the show recently finished its run uh, I think it's got what four seasons or so under its belt and a couple of movies in there ran for four seasons of right. 222 episodes. Which is kind of impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely one of Disney's most longest running cartoons. Yeah. Remember uh, back in the day when Disney cartoons had to be only 65 episodes long? <laughs> so glad we're past that era. Yeah, because, well, because now, overall, the industry is realizing that, yeah, we can have people tune in and repeatedly tune in for long periods of time, as long as it's, you know, actually good and not just the same crap we like to shovel out from time to time. Because <laughs> that's like, we're all contractually obligated to keep watching Spongebob, but, <laughs> you know, like, stuff like uh, Steven Universe and Adventure Time and a lot of these other great shows, like, we're watching it because they're really good. Right. Yes. Steven Universe is already slated for three seasons worth of episodes, and each season's 50 to 11-minute segments. So that's a lot of Steven Universe we got, and we're only in the first half of season two. Right. It's only gonna get better. Yeah, we still only, we still have halfway through the series to go. All right, so I think there's no more fitting way to end this than probably say what well, my favorite cartoon of all time, uh, Tom and Jerry. <laughs> I think we can all agree with that fact. It's a solid choice. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. I Tom mean, and Jerry's a cartoon classic. I mean, it's kind of the. A lot of people say Looney Tunes were probably the greatest cartoons of all time, just because, you know, they're so iconic and all that, but I would say Tom and Jerry is just that much better overall, because for everything Looney Tunes did right, Tom and Jerry probably did that much better with less to work with. Yeah. Because they, they did, they, like, all, all of their humor was visual, but the slapstick they did absolutely perfect compared to any other medium uh the visual storytelling and overall humor was spot on the animation never faltered the music was great and you know to this day tom and jerry probably is my favorite cartoon series of all time like, even more so than the stuff i you know watched as a kid like spongebob invader zim or any of those other shows mm-hmm and I think we can all agree that nothing, nothing will ever be better than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to do it for this uh, rather elongated episode of Whims and Nonsense. Perhaps next time I will think twice before just saying, let's talk about something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe next time we won't be so long-winded. Yes. Uh, but I am your gracious host, Zach, and these are the other people, Abby, Dakota, Devin, whatever. I'm out. Bye. <laughs> right. Bye. Bye.